Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, the five Nordic Artists Council for inviting me today. Uh, first, because it's my first time in Copenhagen, so it's nice to do some sightseeing at the same time. Um, but also because it's a conference with remarkable speakers and a very interesting and important subject. And contrary to what some people could say, even this morning, if I understood, uh, still very relevant. There, there is still cause for concern when it comes to the treatment of, of culture in TTIP. So I am here today on behalf of several organizations at the same time. It's a, kind of a system of Russian dolls, if I can say. So I work at the Société des Auteurs et Compositeurs Dramatiques, which is a, a French collective rights management organization for audiovisual authors and performing arts screenwriters. The Société des Auteurs is the, um, the leading organization of the French Coalition for Cultural Diversity, which I also represent today. Uh, it's a more global organization which represents um, French professional cultural organization as a whole. So not just the audiovisual sector, but also the book sector, uh, music, uh, television, uh, everything you can think about, performing arts, multimedia, visual arts. We are also active at the European level with the European Coalitions for Cultural Diversity, which is a platform composed of groupings and indi individuals involved in the creative arts and industries from 16 different European countries. And CLIS, the Swedish Council of Artists, uh, which is one of the organizations organizing, organizing this conference, uh, is one of them. Um, we are also organized with 42 coalitions uh, at the international level with the International Federation of Coalitions for Cultural Diversity. And for the anecdote, the French coalition is the Federation's permanent representative to UNESCO in Paris. But no matter the organization that I'm representing today, the goal is always the same. We gather our forces to, to protect cultural diversity and promote cultural diversity in all its forms among civil society and amongst political authorities. We have three main objectives. First, to promote the ratification and the implementation of the 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of, of the Diversity uh, of Cultural Expressions. The second objective is to monitor all free trade agreements and defend the cultural exception. And the third goal is more generally to support the expression of cultural and linguistic diversity. Um, we have a right, wide range of activities to reach our goals. We, we monitor ongoing legislation uh, related to the cultural domain. Uh, we organize meetings with decision makers and other civil society organizations uh, to raise awareness and influence the way things are done. Uh, we organize conferences and debates. We participate to public consultations organized by the European Commission. We publish press release. On TTIP more precisely, we, we have done a lot and we're still doing a lot. For instance, we organized a conference in Paris in June 2013 with high-level decision makers, creators, professionals, and civil society. We also organized a sort of small demonstration in Strasbourg in June 2013 uh, with high-profile movie makers such as Costa Gavras. Uh, in order to talk to President Barroso and also alert the, the European Parliament on the danger of the inclusion of audiovisual services in the mandate. Um, we helped to put in place the famous petition called The Cultural Exception is Non-Negotiable, signed by a, a lot of people, I think 8,600 signatures in the end, most of them were movie makers. And more recently, we contributed to the consultation organized by the European Commission on investment pro investments protection um, because we are also very worried by this I ISDS clause, as they call it, and the fact that it could limit states' capacity to regulate and adapt regulations. And of course, if you're interested in this particular matter, I can elaborate. So I was asked to give a perspective on the subject from my country since France has a long tradition of defending the cultural exception. 
And, and I thought it would be easier for you to understand what, what is this cultural exception we're always talking about, because it's not just getting an exemption from a trade agreement. If I would give you a bit of background of how this concept emerged initially. So everything began with the eighth round of multilateral trade negotiations within the framework of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT. It began in 19, 1986 and it was concluded in December 1993. Uh, in late 1993, the United States um, made a statement saying that they wanted audiovisual services to be included in the accord. And that never had happened before. And that explains somehow the general indifference of the cultural sector when the negotiations first started. There was no reason to follow what was going on in trade negotiations. Um, what, what were the reasons explaining the US position? Well, first of all, and I'm sure you know that, um, uh, the US are generally in favor of free trade and of open markets. They, they fight against protection against protectionism in the forms of quotas, in the forms of subsidies. Moreover, they do not view what would they call entertainment products as being substantially different from any other products or services. So why would we make an exception for them? Also in, in 1993, um, American, the American entertainment industry products constituted the second largest exports of the US. So it was in their interest to, to open markets and to liberalize the sector in Europe. And, and finally, American te film and tele television producers were targeting the, the recently adopted EU Broadcasting Directive, Television Without Frontiers, which was adopted in 1999. The directive required that EU member states ensure that broadcasters reserve for European works at least 50 51% of their transmission time. So the European origin requirement was seen as threatening, of course, by American producers. Jacques Valenti, president of the Motion Picture Associations of America, stated at the time that the directive restricted both access and fair treatment of American visual entertainment. But it was not just Hollywood criticizing. The US Congress also passed a resolution condemning the quota as restrictive and as discriminatory. And actually in France it was even more stricter. The quotas were about 60% for European works and 40% for Francophone productions. Yet, why was it dangerous to include audiovisual services in the accord? Well, as you know, the goal of free trade agreements is to reduce, free barrier, free, uh, to reduce barriers to free trade but it also means applying to the liberalized sectors certain rules. Um, for instance, uh, rules that suppress quota systems um, with the so-called obligation of non-discrimination. It also means that you make sure that, um, that countries are gonna treat uh, foreign films and national films the same way. And, and that's the so-called national treatment clause. And if you grant one advantage to a nation, then you have to grant this advantage to all nations. And that's the most favored nation clause. So of course, all these rules would clearly destroy systems of support to creation and culture production in Europe. So that's why France was convinced at the time that nothing short of total exclusion from GATT would do. So France, with this president at the time, Edouard Balladur, and its French culture minister, Jacques Toubon, they mobilized and they rallied uh, other people to the cause and other institutions, such as the European Parliament, such as EU audiovisual ministers, the European film industry, and other countries such as Spain, Belgium, and later on Germany, and UK, I think, as well. In the end, the, the US was unwilling to sacrifice the entire negotiations for the sake of the entertainment industry, so they gave up. Uh, the result was the exclusion of the audiovisual services from the services subsection of GATT, which meant that principles and rules of GATT would not apply to the audiovisual sector. So what were the arguments used by France and the others? What was this cultural exception that they were defending? Well, of course, 
at first, it, this concept, because it was a concept, was more of a communication tool created by friends to have an impact in media, to have an impact in debates, and it, it proved to be quite efficient. But of course, it's much more than a concept now. It means a lot of different things at the same time. It means the fact that you would get an exemption from free trade agreements and not to apply liberalization rules to the cultural sector. It means legitimizing the regulatory and financial interventions of public authorities to support local creation and production. Um, the cultural exception also means not treating culture as a commodity or a commercial item, because culture is part of our heritage, it's part of our identity, so we should treat it differently. Uh, this concept also means that we should defend cultural diversity against homo homogenization of culture and more precisely Americanization of culture. It also means protecting the rights of states to take measures to protect culture. So you see, it means a lot of these different things at the time and things that we still have to defend now. So that, that's why the concept is still quite relevant. So now I thought, I thought I would compare those two years, 1993 and 2013, two years, two battles for the cultural exception, to show you the differences and to show you how it is even more difficult now to, to get what we want. First of all, the GATS, the GATS model was based on a positive list approach. I don't know if you're familiar with the concept, but it means that countries would list their liberalization commitments in particular sectors. And except for these commitments, other, other sectors would be exempt from any obliga obligation as regards market access and national treatment. Well, now mo most FTAs, mo free trade agreements, I mean, are based on the negative list approach. And that's the opposite. It means that everything is on, is on the table. All sectors are open to liberalization, and parties have to specify if they want to exclude certain sectors. So this new approach is, in, is more dangerous in a way because it, mean, it requires more precision, it, re, it requires clear definitions and anticipation of the, over the future. And if you forget to exclude something, if something is not well defined, then, then it's over and there's no coming back. So that's why somehow it's a bit more dangerous. Another big difference is, uh, is that in 1993, we were fighting against American producers while well, today, I would not say that American producers are allies on this, but the ones really pushing for the inclusion of audiovisual sectors are internet multinationals, such as Google, such as Amazon, Apple, and they are much more powerful. They have much more money and much more people working for them in Brussels, in Washington, to, to, to get what they want. So uh, we are clearly not fighting on equal terms here. And what they want, well, is th since they're thriving thanks to the cultural services and products that they provide, but they do not contribute to, to the creation funding mechanism in Europe, well, they don't want the EU to be able to step up and, and imposing obligations on them. What they want also is to find a way to include digital audiovisual services in, in the text. That's why we still have to be careful. And precisely, that's another big difference between 1993 and 2013, the, digi the digital revolution. Because back at the time, audiovisual services were quite easy to identify and define. Now, new services such as video on demand, catch up TV, and so many new services emerge, and they change all the time, they evolve all the time, it's impossible to anticipate. So we need to, to keep flexibility in order to adapt regulations to the digital area and to new challenges. And, the tra and trade agreements, in a way, are the total opposite of flexibility. Once a sector is meant to be liberalized, then, then it's over, it is set in stone, and national governments, no matter their political line, can no longer adopt innovative and, and ambitious policies. They are constrained. So that's why also we have to make sure that audiovisual digital services would not be included in another sneaky way in, in the part of TTIP. And for instance, in the part about telecoms or e-commerce. So that's why terms and the wording that will be used in the agreement will be key. Um, another difference is the president of the commission, of course. 
because it, it certainly makes sense that both commissioners for trade in 1993 with uh, Leon Britain, yes, and in 2013 with the Hurt would, would push for the inclusion of audio, audiovisual services. It's their job, after all, to, to have as many things to negotiate as possible so that they can get things in return. The big difference is that in 1993, the president of the commission was Jacques Delors, a Frenchman, very much aware of the, imp of the importance of culture and slightly less liberal than, than Barroso. So um, he, he, stepped, he stepped up and he defended the cultural exception while, as you know, Barroso wanted to include the audiovisual services. And that, that makes a huge difference for us if we have enemies on the EU side now. So now we'll see for President Jean-Claude Juncker. We, we, we are still in a wait and see attitudes to, towards him. Uh, I could name other differences, such as the fact that, um, that now most agreements that are made are bilateral and not multilateral. And I'm not sh I don't think I have to explain you why, but it changes the whole, the whole dynamics of negotiations. And it also means for us that we always have to be on our guard. You, you obtain something in an agreement, well, that's great, but you have to start all over again with the next one. So it's, it's more difficult. I, I could go on and go on, but the idea is that um, there was cause for concern in 1993. There is still cause for, for concern now, even more now, actually. And, um, and now, yes, I, I leave the floor to you, and I'm more than happy to to elaborate on opposition on TTIP or on the, on the investment protection clause in TTIP, for instance. <laughs> Thank you.